But what I want to talk about first is some mindset shifts that need to happen a little bit before you get started. So this is what I was saying, changing the way that we think about how we produce marketing on our team. So no big bang, no big death star, right, where we pour all of our resources into this one big enormous project, and then it's either going to succeed or fail in an enormous way. We don't want to do that. We want to do small iterations. So we put out a small piece of content and we see how it performs, and then we can build on it if it was successful, or we can do something else. We can pivot if it wasn't, but if it's a small bet, the risk is low. And if we do that consistently over time, we learn a lot really quickly. The second one is to have a sacred space, right, for your content creators. So you can't stop people from needing something from your content team. If nobody needed you for anything, that could be a problem because then you might be having a job security issue. But if you are using Scrum or another agile process that puts a barrier around your content team, right? So we've committed to this certain amount of work in this certain amount of time, and that's what we're doing. And this allows you to be able to say no in a very respectful and uh, genial manner. So you can say, not right now, right? We've committed to doing this work. We'll put that in the backlog and we'll get to it. We promise. Um, and finally, you need to start thinking about your plans as flexible. So one thing that people often think about when they think about agile marketing is that that's great. We'll just, tomorrow we'll be agile. We'll throw our strategy and our plans out the window and we'll just start going. We'll start doing things and we'll just make it up as we go along. But that's not going to work either. Just like your content marketing needs a content strategy behind it, your agile marketing still needs a strategy and a structure underneath it. So planning is important, but you have to be flexible about those plans. So I want to show you this as an illustration of the difference between a traditional waterfall approach, and it's so called because everything builds up at the top and then flows down, versus an iterative approach. So if these are happening in the same amount of time, a waterfall approach spends a whole lot of time on each step, right? So if we're looking at like a six week or a quarter long process here, a waterfall traditional content team is releasing one massive piece of content, like the Death Star, right? And it's either going to explode or succeed in a really big way. Whereas an Agile team would be able to release maybe two smaller and then sort of a medium-sized piece in that same amount of time. And you can even, you'll notice in that last iteration there, the research, the gray piece is missing. Because if you're building on things that have been successful, you can skip some of these steps. You don't have to repeat them over and over again. And each release is also much lower risk, right? So there's, there's less time, there's less resources that are committed to each one. So if it doesn't work, you're not out that much, right? And then you've learned something about how your audience wants to engage with your content. You've learned something about your team's process, right? The, the old fail fast adage, right? You fail, you learn. Just don't fail the same way twice. And then you're moving forward all the time. And this is what I was talking about with the, the sacred space for your content team, right? So I've committed to producing my five blog articles over the next two weeks, and that is my, I've committed, right? I've locked myself in, and my team has locked themselves into producing graphics or videos. Whatever our, our commitment is, we're, we're in. We've committed, and that's what we're going to do. And when sales comes over and says, I really need this new lead gen piece, and I really need it for this conference that's tomorrow, we can say, I'm sorry, you know? Um, it, it reminds me of that motivational poster that you used to see, I think, back in the 90s of lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> so it's like that. We planned our sprint. We're in. But you may have an emergency. And it teaches people how to approach your team as well. You're managing the expectations of other people in your organization. And it helps in the long run, too. The other thing is, these, this is still going to happen, right? We're, we're marketers. Things change. It's just what they do. So if you're in the middle of your sprint and a news opportunity comes up, you don't want to miss that opportunity. But what you can do is track it as what we call a spike. So this is what you're looking at here is called a, a burn down chart. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this specifically as we go along. But the idea is that at the beginning of your sprint, you've committed in this, they've committed to um, 160 
story points. And as the iteration goes on, they're completing some of those points, so the amount of work is going down. And ideally, by the end, you have zero, and you finished it all. But what often happens is this. So right in the middle, you can see that the work went up. More work. Not necessarily ideal, but it happens. So if you're able to track it, you can say that a, an emergency came up that was worth about four points in the middle of our iteration here. And we've, we've documented that, and we can show it so that then you'll see at the end, there are still some points left. They didn't get them all done. So when you're coming back and reporting on this, you can say that we are running at this velocity when we have spikes, this velocity when we don't. So it's better if we don't, right? Or we can document and understand how this changes our team dynamic. We might want to commit to fewer stories in our next iteration if this is a recurring pattern. But we can learn from it, and it helps us deal with the reality of being a marketer uh, because we always are going to have to deal with something going on. And finally, the importance of flexible planning. So good old Dilbert. You can't beat Dilbert. Um, this poor guy here, he reminds me of like when you go off and you create your beautiful content strategy and your editorial calendar, and then you come and you bring it to the team, and everybody's got something to say about it. No, I'm behind because I was waiting on you. And this guy, oh, you left off this one task. So all of your dependencies, your entire calendar is now wrong. And so you have to go back and do the whole thing again. And, and Dilbert, you know, can we, really, can we really say all of our estimates are TBD? Because I've just been throwing random numbers out there. Mm -hmm. I imagine my writers who were like, oh, our deadlines were supposed to be real deadlines, not just like a day that we made up. But anyway, now this poor guy has to go back and redo the whole plan. And that's why we don't do the big enormous upfront plan. We still need plans, we still need schedules and strategies, but if they're small and flexible, then they can help our team succeed in an agile way. And now moving on to the actual planning part, Jeff's gonna take you through this. Cool. And as you can see, she shared a Dilbert cartoon, and for years, that, those cartoons hit home, because I was a software developer, right? And we were, we were, we had all these departments coming in and saying, I need this, I need this, I need this, and, and no one had control. And then finally somebody came up, you know, out of this thing and they said, this is extreme programming. And we're all like, no, right? <laughs> that title, the big X, no. It's like, that, ah, no. And then they said, we're going to pair program. You're going to sit together in a room and write the same software. And we're like, no, that's silly. We're not going to do that. And then there's this scrum process where daily you can stand up in front of a board and share your results. And everyone's like, I'm out of here, <laughs> right? I, am not, I, I could not read for the life of me in fifth grade. And everybody had gold stars but me. And that just brought me back to that place where every day I'm going to have to say, I got nothing, right? <laughs> Somebody interrupted me again or whatever. And I couldn't report any status. So we were in the exact same place where marketers are at now. And we're creating creative stuff and trying to produce at a consistent basis, but more and more was coming in. And so when Agile started to actually take form and people implemented it, you would all of a sudden have this ah moment. And now, 10 years later, after mass adoption, 78% of projects are done in an Agile way. So we see if content marketers or marketers can take this on and try it out and take some of these elements, we can see this thing having that same success, seeing the amount of software change. Just think in the past 10 years how much software has impacted your life because it's changing all the time. It wouldn't be doing that if they didn't adopt a process like this. We would still be being wowed by the first iPhone in 2016. So we have to start in this whole process to roll back with a backlog. We all have it. We all have a whole list of things that we need to do. Most of the time, it's undocumented. So it's just somewhere in a bunch of emails or all over the place. Or it's on a content calendar or an editorial calendar. And I, I love editorial calendars. Some of my friends have some great software um, that, that does it. The problem is not everything's on a month. And I don't like the color red, so I don't want to see overdue all the time because it's hard to put something up there and say, I can do it then, but not have any reality, not have any basis for that, right? It's just a date that I want to hit, but I don't know how big that thing is. So we need to restructure the way we think of that. And let's start to prioritize that list, too. Let's allow somebody to say, 
Nothing has the same priority. This is not a scattered list of content. This is stacked. So whatever's on the top has the highest priority. And then a person, we've talked about this guy for years, this content owner, this chief content officer, or whatever level he is in your company, give them the task to say, your job is to own this. This is what you own now, and it's the backlog. It's the prioritization of the content and the ideas and helping our team understand what's in your head and then allowing us to easily come back and tell you what it's going to take us to do that. And then we need to have some estimates on the team, and we'll talk about that shortly. So the biggest part is it's not for us. It's not about us. In content marketing, everything is driven by the audience. So if the information on there seems to be all about you, then you've done it wrong, and you could throw that card out and try it again. So that's where the content backlog comes from. But it's made up of things. So let's talk about those things. Um, so what is a content item? What lives on that backlog? And I've spent years and years and years trying to talk to developers about these things called user stories. And they still get it wrong. And it's a great idea, but I think it can be hard to implement. So I lay it out in this way. You need a title, not a headline, not something you're going to spend hours and hours trying to perfect and see how many odd numbers you can get and the word killer in there and then make it clickable, right? <laughs> no, just a title. What are you calling this thing? Then a story. So we're, we're all storytellers now because we've been hit over the head for years that we need to be storytellers. So what is the story behind the person who's reading your content. So as a persona or a type of person, I need a piece of content for on a particular topic so that I can what? What's that value, right? What am I going to take this article on the 50 most popular pieces of marketing technology out there and do with it? Am I going to feel good about it or am I actually going to make a business decision, right? What is that thing that I'm trying to do? Once you've understood that, let it breathe for a little bit. Write it down, right? Move on to a few other items. And then come back to that idea and lay out how your team actually plans to demonstrate that value. What are those five things that you're going to absolutely put into this thing so that you can make sure you deliver on that value proposition you said you were going to do? And once you start there, now that article takes, or that piece of content, that video, that, that podcast, takes a whole nother life because you've got someone in mind, you've got a problem in mind, and those team of writers you have have the five pieces that have to be in there. So consistency across the board, you can start to produce the same article by each member. And what you can do after that is to break it into pieces and allow other members of your team to work on things and not have that waterfall. And so some optional elements that I find highly valuable is the emotion or the empathy, right? What, what are they in? What's the problem? Like, what's that mindset like? Is it high stress or is it relaxed, right? Are we planning for them to listen to this on the way to work? So let's not be, you know, let's not be DJ, morning you know, news kind of guy, but let's be, you know, emotional. Let's, let's have that value in there. And then what's that call to action? Not every single time sign up for my newsletter either, but what's the call to action? Maybe it's read another post. Maybe it's stop and think. What do you want them to do so that they sink in the value for this piece of content? And then, and then next is, let's get some estimates in here, right? Because if I'm sitting in a room with this, you know, somebody who's a staff writer at Time Magazine and we talk about writing an article, on you know, some Alaskan voyage or something like that, it's going to take me a heck of a lot longer than it would them because they've been doing this forever. They know who to call. They know how to get flights and go, and they got camera crews and all that stuff, and I got nothing. So we need to capture that because it's going to be important as a team to know what the general accepted value is for the size of this piece of content. And so we pick a sequence, whatever sequence that is. You like to use small, medium, large, extra large. And so you could see how many extra larges you could fit in there, or how many larges and mediums. I like to use a thing called planning poker, which is a number of ideal days. So how many fictional days, if we all sat in this room and the door shut and all that stuff, we estimate 
this particular item, how many days would it take us collectively to get this done? And then we can apply science and math and all that stuff later down the road that will give us some reality to the picture. But we leave some gaps in the middle for uncertainty. Because if it's going to take you 15 or 16 days to create that content, it, that's an impossibility to, to figure out, right? But one to two days, we got that. We know the size, right? One is double the other one. And so the further it out, the more uncertainty.